Tranquility du Jour, July 30th, 2018. Hello there, this is Kimberly Wilson, and welcome to the 426th episode of Tranquility du Jour, a podcast featuring artists, activists, and authors around the globe. Today we're chatting with Yvonne Talley on her latest book, Breaking Up with Busy. The subtitle, Real Life Solutions for Overscheduled Women. I'm sure many of you can relate to this. And during this interview, we discuss the overscheduled woman, tips to break up with being busy, and ways to understand what's driving our busy behavior. And if you're new to Tranquility Du Jour, there's a link in the show notes to find out more. Also, a big thank you to everyone who was able to tune in last week for the Facebook Live event from Paris. And anyone who isn't on Facebook, no worries. The video is also up on YouTube, and I have a link in the show notes. So we're fresh back from Paris. We actually arrived at 9 p.m., or we got home at 9 p.m., which is 3 a.m. Paris time yesterday, last night, and uh, are still functioning, which is quite impressive considering the jet lag. And so we'll see how this week continues to unfold. But I have to say, it was such a phenomenal week. We had an amazing group of women joining the Pinning in Paris retreat. And then we also had some time on the front end during the weekend and on the back end. And I posted lots of photos over on the blog. So be sure to check the, those out, KimberlyWilson.com slash blog. And we had Miss Belle with us, who was just amazing. And we even had pet mice. They weren't really pets, but they became our little pets um, in our Airbnb. And we named him, or I named him, Francois. And then he seemed to have a little bit of a family who we met later on in the week. So anyway, it was a true delight. It was just, uh, Paris is such, a, you know, assuming we said, a movable feast, but just all the sensory details. So I'll be doing a blog post later this week on what are my takeaways from the experience. There are a lot of repeats, meaning a lot of my old haunts like Shakespeare and Company, W.H. Smith, things along those lines. And then there was also some brand new experiences like a vegan concept store and a gourmet vegan restaurant and all sorts of fun kind of new adventures also. So again, I'll share a little bit more about those later on this week in the blog post. And then one thing that's super exciting also is this week I'm moving into my own office space for psychotherapy for the past basically I guess almost two years year and a half I've been subletting space which has been wonderful in this beautiful historic building right off DuPont Circle and then a space became available and I'm moving into it this week which I'm so delighted about and the decor because really that's the main reason I want my own space is to be able to you know really create a setting that is super inviting, welcoming, and soothing. And so I'm going for a boho uh, a boho glam look and um, all sorts of really fun things. So I'll do a Facebook Live event once that's set up and definitely share photos. And again, that is one of the highlights from this week that I'm so, so excited about. I also wanted to ask any of you who have been listening for a while and or have read any of my books, if you would take a moment to pen a review on iTunes and or pen a review for any of my books on Amazon or Goodreads, I would be so, so grateful. My hope is that that ultimately helps spread tranquility and helps other people find more of it in their own lives. Also, before we hear from Yvonne, a few upcoming events. Of course, we have Year of Tranquility, which is ongoing, and we had uh, almost half of the ladies with us were involved in Year of Tranquility. Half of the ladies with us in Paris were involved in Year of Tranquility, and it was just such a delight to be with them and to hear how this program has actually had an effect. And you are welcome to join at any time, and that gives you access to the backlog if you join the annual part. And you can also just drop in for monthly. And the next month, so for August, it's all about self-care, then mindfulness, we have writing, entrepreneurship, and meaning. So those are the rest of the modules for the year. 
Also, if you'd like to join me for an online retreat from the comfort of your own home, on October 20th, I'll be leading the Softening into Fall virtual retreat. Then, of course, we have Tranquility Du Jour Live coming up in September, which is a free event. You can find more about that also in the show notes. Riding in the Woods in West Virginia. That's the last weekend in October, and we have four spots left for that. And then we're back to Costa Rica in February, and then Tuscany next July. So all the details, of course, for these are in the show notes. Would love, love, love to have you. Now, without further ado, our featured guest, Yvonne Talley, is the author of Breaking Up with Busy and leads meditation and de-stressing programs for corporations, individuals, and private groups in Silicon Valley. An NLP master practitioner, Yvonne co-founded Poised Inc., a Pilates and wellness training studio, and is the founder of the Sisterhood of the Traveling Scarves, a charity that provides headscarves to cancer patients. She lives in Northern California. Visit her online at YvonneTally.com. Welcome, Yvonne. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you today, Kimberly. Well, you know, I have to say, whenever New World Library reached out to me about your amazing book, Breaking Up with Busy, Real Life Solutions for Overscheduled Women, I was like, done and done. So I'm so happy to have you here today. And you know what I love about the start of the book, too, is you start out saying how I'm busy is the new I'm fine. And it made me think too of like how it's like crazy busy is whenever it's like really kind of over the top. It's like, I'm just crazy busy, crazy busy. And you know what I have to say? What stopped me from saying that probably about five years ago? I don't know if you read the article that came out in the New York Times called The Busy Trap. I did not. I did not read about that, but it sure makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, it's so, so good. I highly recommend it. And listeners, I'll put a link in the show notes. But it was like all over Facebook and what have you again, probably about five years ago. But it's so good. And that's what allowed me to break up with saying the word, maybe not with being busy, but definitely with saying the word. So, you know, talk about a little bit about how I'm busy is kind of almost like a bit of a badge of honor, but it is our go-to. It's not like I'm fine. It's a beautiful day. It's I'm busy. Yeah, exactly. And I, what I find really interesting, and I talk about this, is that the when we used to greet one another, uh, we would greet with, I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. And that's when our culture was much more private And now today we are just fully exposed between social media, you know, technology. And so this idea of being busy kind of came along as far as when, you know, incomes rise, busy or excuse me, time is seen as more valuable and we want to pack in as much as we possibly can. And so this idea of being busy, as you said, it's kind of a badge of honor. It's a, it's it's like a a way of expressing that I'm important. I've got things to get done because it's time is valuable. And once this ball gets rolling and the people that we share our life with, they're busy. So for us to be a part of that group and to get along and to have that connection, we're busy too. It works both ways. So whatever that group might be, we connect on this busy level. And it's gone from something that we do to being a pastime. You know, we would say at one time, oh, I have a busy afternoon. Now it's just, I'm busy all the time. So there's no boundaries. It just continues. So it goes from something that we do to being a habit, to being entrenched in our culture. And it it has a, a lot of effect on our personal wellness, our health, our spiritual growth, our all of it, because it's a very big distraction about being able to from being able to connect with who we are. So, but because we identify with these people in our lives and everyone else is busy and we're comparing ourselves so much more now, and that has a lot to do with social media. The idea of busy is now the new normal. That's just the way that's what we're doing. And to break out of that, we have to be the one that kind of slows the bus, so to speak, takes a deep breath and asks ourselves, What is it that I really want? And is busy really going to get me there? Which is so powerful, right? To actually take that step back and be like, is this how I want to live my life? Yes. And I think often it certainly had something to do for me. You know, we have to get, I always say the universe will tap you on the shoulder or, you know, hit you alongside the head. And and I call that an exclamation point in life. 
And sometimes an exclamation point has to happen. For me, it was a health scare uh, where I thought I was having a heart attack, but I actually ended up being a panic attack. Never had one before, never had one since then. Uh, that was brought on by this hectic, busy, get it done, do it right, be the best, you know, take care of everybody all at one time, which is something many of my clients have expressed to me over the years. Certainly something I think that many women feel. And it's just this continuous pace of doing and getting things done. And for me, that's what landed me in the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack. So that was my wake up call. What I'm trying to do with the book is get the message out that you don't need to have that happen. Here's some solutions and practical measures that you can put into your life to start to create some of those boundaries. So you're not always busy all of the time. And that that time, time is precious. It's all that we have. And we have to take a look at what this busy pace is doing to the relationships that we have in our life. How is it affecting our emotional intimacy with our partners? How are we, what are we modeling for our children? Uh, how are we creating space and time to nurture not only our body, but our mindful self and our spiritual self? So it, on the surface, it looks kind of frivolous and fun. Oh, I'm busy. But deeper down, it really has had a, a large effect on all of those, as I spoke about the health, the spiritual connection and our relationships. Yeah. And one thing too is definitely our relationships with others, but our relationship with ourself becomes quite fragmented because it's the inability to actually hit the pause button and notice like, huh, how am I feeling? You know, what is going on for me physically, mentally, and emotionally? And it's hard when we're running from thing to thing to thing. I teach a weekly mindfulness class and we do a mindful check-in at the beginning where people will just sit down a couple minutes, we take a pause, and then we do introductions of like, what's your name and what did you notice during the mindful check-in? And so many people will be like, oh my God, I just realized I have a headache or I just realized my back hurts. You know, it's stuff that they weren't even able to notice because they were so busy going from one thing to the next throughout the day that they weren't even able to check in with their physical being. Yes, Kimberly, and that's a really good point because what happens is it becomes, we become used to being busy. It becomes our juice as far as what we're familiar with. That's that habit piece. So the more we do something, the easier it is for us to do. We don't think about it. That's the beauty of habits is it allows our mind, it conserves the mind's energy, so to speak. Um, and that's important because if we were always constantly thinking about what we were doing or being very, very aware, uh, just driving to to work each morning or, you know, taking that same path that we do to school or wherever it might be, would be something that we'd have to be really fully engaged in. So uh, habits are important, but when they become a habit as busy has become now, we, be, we get used to that pace. I remember my mother, uh, you know, she raised six kids as a single mother. And even after all of us were raised and we come back with our own children, she still had that busy pace. Uh, because it was what she was used to. And it took her years to find that solitude and, and a different pace, if you will, to slow down enough to enjoy the quiet time, to be able to connect with oneself. And I find that in meditation, when I teach meditation, often if I have someone new, they'll say, oh, I fell asleep. I just, I feel so tired now. And what I always share with them is you are relaxed and your body forgot what that felt like. You're not tired, you're relaxed. You just nourished and replenished your body and, and mind in a way for the last 45 minutes that you probably haven't done since you were a tiny baby and rested. You know, we're resting uh, and we just don't do that anymore. We, we find quiet time and still time. There's still a lot of stigma attached to that. I always say leisure is the new lazy. People frown upon it. And in reality, it's crucial for our well-being, our complete well-being. So yeah, it's it's a pace. We get used to it. We are distracted by it. Some that works well for some people. Perhaps they don't want to face what it is that's going on in their life. So busy creates that distraction for them. And then ultimately, frequently, it becomes a habit. And now we have to unwrap that habit, as you said, to be, kind of back up from it, slow down from it, hit the pause button and ask the question, how am I feeling? What is it I'd like to bring into my life? What is it that I desire? And then start to move in that direction one step at a time. And so how do you encourage people, our listeners and people that you work with to actually 
break this habit because I think you're right. It is something we, it's like we, this becomes, it comes a way of being. This is just the way in which one can show up in the world. And how do you slowly begin to slow it down and make shifts? And, and really, you know, one of the things you talk a lot about in your book is the difference between the need, our needs and our wants and making that connection. So can you speak to a little bit about this habit and our needs and our wants? Yes. So yeah, I have an exercise in the book called the need want connection. And what, what I find always very interesting with clients is that they'll come in and they'll say, I want, I want to do X, Y, or Z. I want this or that to happen. And the next question that I'll ask them is, uh, well, what, what will change for you when you, when you do that, have that, or you're in that place. And often I'm met with question mark because they haven't taken the time to even consider what is going to change for them? And also, uh, how will they know when that change has occurred if they don't know what it is? So it's about backing up and seeing what do I need to get to that want? And part of that is allowing ourselves permission in a way to say, this is my life. This is a gift. This is what I'm going to bring to myself first, because remember, we have to care for oneself before we can care for others. Very important. And as women, we often miss that piece. We get very focused on taking care because we are nurturers by spirit um, and we get used to taking care of others and putting our needs our desires and our wants in that optional column at the end of the day, if we get to it, if I make time for myself, that's great. And there's almost a status attached now to the the idea that I didn't have time for myself because I had so much to do. I was so busy because I'm important. So some of the ways that I start out with is the first thing I do is I have that conversation about their need, want connection. And then so simple. And often when I say this to clients or to people that I'm having a conversation with, when I say that what I'm going to say next, they look at me like I've lost all my marbles, like (laughs) this can't possibly help me in any way. Breathe, simply breathe, place your hand on your heart, the center of your chest and feel your breath moving down into the center of your chest and exhaling in that one simple act. And I've had clients where I've only been able to do five breath cycles with before they can get to a point where they can focus on their breath, then focus on their breathing for a minute then do a one minute meditation, then a three minute meditation. And the point that I'm making here, Kimberly, is it's one step at a time. It's not this big, vast, sweeping change, because then that becomes, oh my goodness, now I've got something else to do. It's one change at a time. But first, we have to answer that question. What do I want? And what do I need to get to that want? And how will I know What will change for me? How will I know when it changes? What are my signals? What am I looking for? That is a very concrete way way to start this process of breaking up with busy and giving yourself permission that it's okay to do that. Permission is such a key piece of this. Absolutely. Because, and, and again, that idea that, um, permission that I have to give myself permission to do X, Y, or Z. For some people, they'll come to it much more quickly. They'll they'll say, absolutely, I deserve that. And then they'll start to move that ball in that direction. But we can't forget there's many people, uh, and especially women, that have never allowed themselves to even answer that question or make that statement. I give myself permission to take five, 10 minutes, whatever it might be, to replenish myself, to be in nature, to take a walk, to call a loving friend and have a, you know, an uninterrupted conversation with that person. So these are very simple, basic things that we can do, but we've forgotten to do them because we are so often distracted by this busy pace. And you know what um, I love about this is the reminder, as you said earlier, about permission and then just the pausing and the slowly, as you said, kind of like, it's almost like micro movements where it's just one step at a time of beginning to make these changes. It's not like we can wake up one day and be like, okay, I'm no longer going to be busy, right? We have to like, it's a mindset shift. 
It's definitely a mindset shift. And uh, in the book, I write about those mindset shifts where the practices that we can use to make that happen. And you're right. It, waking up one day and saying, okay, that's it. I'm not going to do those 12 things on my on my uh, list today because I always do these 12 things or 12 different things in a day or that pace because we're used to it. One of the things I always say is awareness cannot be undone. Once we are aware of something, it's, it's, it's uh, unlikely that we are going to become unaware of it, so to speak. So just by us, you and I having this conversation and whoever's listening, they now are aware that this pace exists. And that's why I always come from a health and mindful uh, position with this, because the impact on our health, the ability to be able to rest, you know, the site of insomnia, increased blood pressure, elevated heart rate, uh, immune systems being attacked because uh, we are constantly in this ball of stress, so to speak, and pumping cortisol through our body. These are all the things that happen in this pace. This is part of the addictive quality or the addictive uh, uh, components to being busy all the time. And so to undo that, to wake up one morning and say, you're not going to do that anymore is going to set us up for failure. So we want to set ourselves up for success. So that's why I say make one step at a time. Start with that question. Start with the breathing exercise. Start with the one minute meditation or begin by asking yourself, am I busy or do, do I want to be busy or do I want to be productive? Because there's a difference. Productive, we prioritize. Busy, we say yes to everything. We'll do everything with, and just have that free fall of doing everything. So we want to really check in with ourselves. Do I want a productive day or do I want a busy day? And, you know, one of the pieces, too, that's interesting is you kind of break out the overscheduled woman, OSW, into different kind of types. So can you speak to that just so that our listeners might have a better understanding of where they might fall within this? Yes. So the OSW, the overscheduled woman, I think most women have felt like an overscheduled woman for sure. Uh, But it's that get it done attitude, get it done, make it right, make it perfect, make it the best and then do it again and repeat it again and again. So it's this just idea that it's a continuous, uh, endless pace that we're on. And as the overscheduled woman with this attitude of always getting it done, what happens is there is an imbalance between obligation and expectation. And what ends up happening is our own personal wellness gets pushed to one side as we try to keep this pace. So in the book, I write about five different types, the time optimist, uh, perfectionist, the sorority sister, the alpha, and the pleaser. So typically, we all have a little bit of maybe one or two of them in us, but there's typically one that's really predominant in each of us. And, and I provide the solutions, the not only the, the uh, practical solutions, but the mindful practices to help get out of that busy pace and those traps. So as an example, the alpha is that, that uh, get it done attitude. She's a natural leader. She loves a challenge. She's extremely resilient. She has no pr- you know, problem working on her own. And she often is the one that's going to push the ball down the down the down the field, so to speak. And so she puts a lot of demand and a lot of pressure on herself. When this becomes unresourceful for her, she can become overbearing and extremely dominant. That's when she it becomes over, you know, unresourceful for her. These other characteristics are work for her well. So left unchecked. She'll get into that space and she will push people away because of that. It's hard to have an you know intimacy emotional intimacy with somebody who's very overbearing and domineering. So uh, she would be one of the types in the book. And then on the other end of that would be probably the pleaser who is constantly trying to make everyone else feel good about what they're doing. And she forgets to do the same for herself. Uh, And like I said, there's a little bit of one or two of them in each of us, but they'll for certain be something that pops out that's more that's bigger and has more content to it one type other than the other and you talk about the essentials right being um 
the super solutions process and meditation magic. And can you walk us through, because I love this, the super solutions process, which um, super solutions driven and focused for anyone who's worked with like solutions focused therapy. So I love this. Can you speak to that? Yes. So the super solution is this five step process uh, where I'll just go through it quickly. But first you state the problem and then you flip that into a statement of, of solution. And then you spotlight that. We do, there's a process in there that's called whittling. So, the, so what we want to do is we'll have a big statement. A client will come to me and she'll say, this is the problem. And she'll go into a long explanation of what the problem is. Then I will help her flip that into a solution. Uh, and I'll have her whittle it down to six to 10 words. Now, that part of the, the process is what helps us get very clear on that need want connection. Because what we start to realize is there's a lot of emotion attached in here. And what are the facts? How I can only get to that need because then the need of that need want connection are the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of how we're going to accomplish what we're going to accomplish. So in that process, in that super uh, solutions process, we do that. We whittle it down, we spotlight it, and then we do what I call mindful meditation. It's where we incorporate our imagination, which really is what mindful med meditation is, is incorporating our imagination in that and a solution-based uh, outcome. What is it that we want now? And now let's put it through our mindful mental solution process through meditation. You know, they, we do this a lot in performance training as well. Instead of going out and shooting baskets uh, for the game, we will also put in part of that training as imagining that you're out on the court, whatever it might be. I'm using basketball as an example. Uh, you're out on the court, you're shooting the basket, you retrieve the ball, you go back, you do it again. So this is a very helpful way to bring this into the conscious mind because we know by law of attraction, we know what we attuned to, what we pay attention to is what we will likely create. And then we make an outcome statement. The fifth part of that is to make an outcome statement, my desired outcome, and be very clear on what that is. And so it's a quick way to get in touch and have a solution rather than getting stuck in that trap of emotion. I can give an example, for instance, for the super solution process. So it would be the problem might be something like I have no time to exercise because work takes everything I have. And that that's that is the stated problem. So how are we going to find the solution? Well, we have to we have to kind of turn it around. We have to flip that into a solution. So we have to explore what am I getting from this problem? What am I getting by staying um, by not exercising? What is it taking from me or what is it giving to me? What's, what is it about that I, my, my long hours at work are giving to me? So we have to unwrap that a little bit and turn that into a solution. So, um, and we start out by saying, I feel better about myself if I exercise or lose a few pounds, I'll be more patient with my kids. And it just, the, the, the whittling process allows us to get really clear about what we're going to get from our desired outcome. And in this case, the desired outcome would be to work out so that she has more energy so that she can enjoy her family more. So the, it, I help them turn that around so that that problem now, they move away from the problem. Because what happens, Kimberly, is we spend all of our energy and conscious time in the problem rather than in the solution. So how are we going to ever get to the solution if we're not exploring it and constructing it in a way that we can accomplish it. Beautifully said. It makes me think of that Einstein quote, right? Whenever you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, yeah. it's like actually <laughs> insanity. So, um, there you, go. <laughs> you know, and one of the things that I love about your book too, is the busy busting solutions, right? So there are things like Descheduling, coding your calendar, a healthy no, uh, taming time. And uh, I love this, count your yesings and flip. So can you speak a little bit? Oh, and of course, healthy boundaries, which are so important. Um, can you speak a little bit about, you know, some of these tools? Because I know I just listed a ton and you have a ton outlined in your book. Some of these tools that you're like, ah, oh, if our listeners adopted this one or this too, they would notice a profound difference. Oh, well, I'm going to go right to healthy boundaries then, because that is it in a nutshell, because that's what this is really 
about that the bolts and nuts and bolts of it is about that healthy boundaries. And I always say boundaries are like handrails on a staircase. Everyone feels better when they're there. So if we set boundaries for ourselves, we teach all the people around us that we're sharing our life with, not just our children, but our office mates, people that we're sharing our life, our partners, our spouses, whomever that might be. We are modeling the behavior that we expect or desire to have in those relationships. Something really interesting happens when you do this. You help, not only do we help other people set those boundaries, but everybody knows that your no means no, that your yes means yes, and that when you, when you say, I'm leaving at five o'clock the office on Thursday because I have a class I'm taking, they will stop asking you, can you just stay another hour or 45 minutes or whatever it will be? Because how often does this happen? Oh, can you just stay another 30 minutes? And then the 30 minutes turns into an hour and a half. I'm using that as one example, but it happens continuously all the time. So setting your boundaries, clear, consistent communication, and then sticking to them is what's not only going to help you have that, sp- that space of mind but to, to, to be able to nourish your mind, your body, it's also going to clear up communication between anybody. It's going to save a lot of time with this back and forth. Can you, will you, might you? Uh, and you're going to feel so much better because you're going to need to give yourself permission to have that time. And people will start to respect that time. Not that they haven't, but they'll know that that is the time that you've set aside for yourself or whatever it might be. And you'll start to feel better about that, more empowered to do that in more areas of your life. So setting boundaries is critical. And I love too, at the end of the book, you've got your busy free playbook and you have 52 tips to help us break up with busy. Yes, that that was fun writing that part of the book because it's just, you know, I give the information and then we get to a point where now what do we do with that? You can always go back and revisit any of the solutions or practices at any time. And that's really what the book is designed to do. But now we have something that will lift our spirits and our thinking and our mindfulness throughout the week or the day. And so each week you can just pull any one of those up. And one of my favorites is find that Friday state of mind because we always talk about oh thank goodness it's friday and it's that same feeling we get when we're planning a vacation or going somewhere so i always tell my clients if things are getting too tough plan a day off and if you can't take a day off plan plan a mental time out and by planning it then we allow ourselves to look forward to it and when we're when we are there at that space where we have given ourselves time off or an afternoon, whatever it might be, a mental break, take myself to lunch day, whatever it might be. It just feels so much even more enjoyable and rewarding because we plan to do that. We've had that time to look forward to it. And it doesn't have to be a Friday. It can be any day. So it's just a way to keep yourself in a mental, mindful state of being. So you can remember that you have the decision and the power of choice to make your day any way that you desire. Beautifully said. And I think it's such a great reminder, particularly around this idea of mindset and then these just small little tweaks to actually make our lives feel less full, less busy, less overwhelming and more, you know, as you were saying, like the Friday, kind of that Friday feeling. It's like, how can we package that? You know what I mean? And like have yeah. that, especially Sunday nights, which are really hard on some people. So it's like, oh, we still have this sense of like, ah, oh, it's a fresh new week. Like we do with, oh, it's a fresh weekend. That's right. So it's just, you know, it's, it's turning around how we're looking at something. And that is the key because our attitude towards what our, what we're doing is going to really dictate how we move through it. So if we if we have that kind of Sunday blue or here we go again, then I then I would take that as an opportunity with my client to say, well, let's let's look about what's coming up on Monday that is influencing those feel those feelings. And, you know, we can't just change a job whenever we want to. Not all of us can do that. So what are some of the elements of the day that we have that we can make those adjustments where then on Sunday we can have a different attitude towards our Monday? 
I love that. And I think it's such a great reminder. And, you know, this idea, too, of it puts a little bit more power within us versus like it being in what day of the week is it? Exactly. Yeah. We could, because, you know, again, we get into a habit. They're, they're important, but we get into a habit of thinking a certain way, too. It's not just what we're doing. It actually starts with how we're thinking. You know, some of us are born as or learn to be just have this optimistic, positive uh, framework that we approach things with. Others aren't. And so we, I think it's important as teachers that we be mindful of the fact that, that this is a this could be a real stretch for people to have this, this mindset about I actually have the power. I actually I, I hesitate to use the word control, but control is part of that. But that's that comes to choice. So I have the power of choice to decide how I'm going to feel about this particular situation. When we blame, we are become very focused on what's going on on the outside. For us to have change, we have to focus on what's going on on the inside. That is all that we can control is how we feel and what we do about that. So it's very, it, this puts the power back within the person when they say, ah, I do have the power of choice in this situation. I do have the power over how I feel and what I do say, think. Beautiful. Thank you. Such good reminders. And this leads us into our final question, which is the name of this podcast is Tranquility Du Jour. And of course, we've just talked through a ton of tips on finding more tranquility and less busyness in our lives. But what I'm curious is for you, kind of what's your go to for finding tranquility in your everyday? Oh, that's so easy. My garden. It's very, I, I am continually recharged and restored by being in nature. And I take a walk through my garden numerous times during the day when I'm at my home. And I always start the day with meditation and sometimes even end the day with meditation. It allows me to be in a conscious mindset of not only gratitude, but to also show up in this space and time to do the work that I've been sent here to do. So it's a, it's meditation and being in nature. And that's how I keep my tranquility. And that's how I bring that within my spirit and self. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Kimberly. So you can find Yvonne on Facebook at Live Life Vibrantly, Twitter at Yvonne Talley, Instagram at Yvonne underscore Talley, and of course her website, YvonneTalley.com. As mentioned in the podcast, I have a link to our 20-minute video that I recorded from Paris. And then there's also a link to sign up for Love Notes, and I'll be sending out a Love Note within the next couple of weeks. That gives you access to Tranquil Treasures, which is an assortment of all sorts of PDFs, MP3s, and videos to, again, ideally help you find more tranquility among the busyness, among the busy kind of, uh, you know, bustling life that we have. And the great thing is, is, you know, there are these, no matter how busy we are, there are these little pockets of respite that we can intersperse that can make such a difference. Also, there is a link to The Busy Trap, which I mentioned during the podcast interview, a really wonderful article that came out a few years ago that totally switched my perspective on saying that I was busy. There's also a link in the show notes to various social media ways to find me, a link to my books, e-courses, the Tranquility Du Jour podcast app, and of course, the Tranquility clothing line. So again, thank you as always for joining me. And my apologies for the snoring pugs in the background. Gizmo seems quite exhausted from having his caretaker here while we were gone for the past 10 days. So he has been all curled up and cuddled with me, which is such a delight. It was so fun to get back last night and be surrounded by all our four pets again. Wishing you a wonderful week ahead. And thank you as always for tuning in. Namaste. Namaste.